Hi everybody, this is Dr. Arlo clark -Fuss. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan-Dearborn. I'm also a cognitive psychologist, and I want to tell you a little bit about how um, cognitive psychologists think, what sort of things we study, what the class is about, and then what you can do with a degree or a specialty in cognitive psych. So I'm an expert in human learning and um, cognition, particularly memory research, but that doesn't mean that Cognition is specifically memory, that's just one of many things that we study. In fact, we, we study very low-level processes as well, like attention. So when you're able to multitask, you're likely watching this video while others, perhaps roommates, family members, pets, are, are wandering around the house, um, or neighbors outside making noise, but you're able to pay attention to the video. How are you multitasking? How are you filtering out things? We oftentimes use experimental research to test these exact mechanisms to, to determine based basically how attention works. We also study perception. So the things that you attend to, you try and identify what they are, right? I look at my laptop and I know that I'm looking at a laptop and not a television or a puppy or any other objects that I know about. And so one of the things that we study then is how we are able to perceive or engage in that pattern recognition process. When we look at items, do we break them down into features? Do we look at it as an overall object? Which of these two theories is better supported by research? Again, that's one of the areas that, that cognitive psychology studies. And then, as I previewed with my own specialty, we clearly study memory. How that information from the environment gets processed, gets stored then, and then gets used, recovered, and guides behavior later on. We have these network models that explain how memories are related to one another and stored in the brain. We talk about how memories can be more efficiently transferred from short-term or working memory into long-term memory, so they're permanent, so that you remember them next week on the exam. We also talk about eyewitness testimony and how stereotypes and biases affect our memory for events in ways that can sometimes get us into trouble and, and get others into trouble. We also study language. So language is one of those unique things that makes humans humans, but it's also a very, very complicated area of study. And so, for example, you may remember a time in school where you raised your hand, the teacher called on you, and you said, can I go to the bathroom? And although you knew that you meant, may I go to the bathroom, they took that moment to point out the distinction to you between can I go and may I go. Well, that's a subtle distinction, distinction in language where the literal definition differs a little bit from the intent. That's something we study in psycholinguistics, the psychological study of language, and that also is a purview of cognitive psychology. We then also study things like problem solving, where we use all of these other aspects of cognitive psych, like attention, perception, and memory, and language, to see how we might apply all of those behaviors, those skills, to solving some problem in front of us, sometimes with controlled tasks like this Tower of Hanoi task, other times with things like riddles, with insight problems that require us to think about a solution for a long time, and sometimes come to a sort of aha moment when we finally do. And then, by no means is this list exhaustive, but we also try and look at all of these various behaviors and others through a lens of neuroscience. Cognitive psychology is slowly merging more and more with cognitive neuroscience, and so we use tasks that sometimes study individuals who've had damage to their brain to see how damage to that area affects particular behaviors, allowing us to localize those behaviors to those areas of the brain. But we also look at brain scans of intact adult individuals, right? Living, living humans using EEG, and fMRI and all kinds of cool technologies and cognitive psychology gets to talk about those approaches as well to studying human behavior. What is it that we do, I guess, more generally? What do all these areas have in common? It's all about information processing. It's about how there's so much information in our environment, whether it's coming from the TV or, or just visual sites around us that we seem to be looking at, things that we're hearing, things that we're smelling and seeing. How does our brain take in that information? Well, we use a metaphor of what's called the information processing model to talk about how information starts in our environment, gets processed, gets filtered, gets identified, gets stored in short-term memory, and sometimes, if it's important, makes its way into long-term memory where we can hopefully later on retrieve it and use it on a test or use it in any other way we might need. To that end, I've always really thought of cognitive psychologists as being the engineers. All the other fields of psychology identified all the really cool phenomena that exist out there. Cognitive psychologists are the ones that came in and said, well, I like your radio, but I'm going to rip it apart and see how it works. So I want to find out what behaviors from a cognitive standpoint, like attention and memory and language, are responsible for some of the phenomena that we see in other areas of psychology as well. And so if you found yourself to be an engineer and asking yourself questions about why this works or why humans behave in the way that they do, psychology and maybe cognitive psychology is the, the way for you. But what can you do?
with a degree or a specialty in cognitive psychology, whether graduate or undergraduate, well, who are we? In many cases, cognitive psychologists become, like I did, academics. We like to have this balance of teaching other individuals about cognitive psychology and doing research on our own, learning more about the areas that we specialize in. Again, in my case, human learning and memory. But not all cases do we do that. Sometimes we end up in industry. Sometimes doing research for firms, in other cases doing business or marketing research. A cognitive psychologist, remember, understands how humans process the environment, how they take in information, what things they attend to, how they remember it. This is critical to advertising if you want your product to be purchased and remembered by those potential customers. So cognitive psychologists are very useful in this field. We also have been used heavily in industries like social media. Again, industries that are heavily involved in wanting to know how humans process information. When you present a complicated series of posts on Instagram or Facebook, what areas do they look at on the screen? What areas do they take in quickly? What other areas require more thought? Again, very heavily used by social media corporations that are out there. And then because of its relationship to human thinking and how human thinking may be modeled by artificial intelligence systems, cognitive psychologists have been instrumental in building a lot of these newer artificial intelligence, these driverless vehicles, and, and many other of the newest technologies. Realistically, a cognitive psychologist, because we understand how human beings think, we're used in almost every field that exists out there. So thank you for watching this little video. Hopefully I've intrigued you a little bit about cognitive psychology and you maybe want to take the class or learn a little bit more or maybe even go to graduate school or get some research in cognitive psych. That's it. Go Blue.